Good afternoon to you. Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your Hurricane Outlook and discussion for Wednesday, the 16th of May, 2018. Looking at the Eastern Pacific, their season began yesterday. Nothing brewing out there at the moment. If we look at the what we call the geo color, it's a beautiful shot, isn't it? From the GO-16 showing a good deal of the Western Hemisphere. And here is the Southeast Pacific. A little bit of activity convection-wise along the intertropical convergent zone. That's where the trades and the air comes together from the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. And you get this convergence line, air coming together or converging. And then it goes up. It can't go down because there's an ocean in the way. So it goes up, and we call that the ITCZ. And you can see that generally, you know, something like that from the Atlantic through South America and then out into the northeast part of the Pacific Ocean here or the southeast region of the North Pacific. Uh, the bottom line is nothing happening, even though there is a little bit of scattered convection. Also a little blob of convection here in the Yucatan Channel vicinity and then out across the tropical Atlantic, it's May, so why even mention it, right? So let's just move on. All right, a quick animation here. This is from uh, the Goes West. This will be replaced as well, I guess, by the Goes 17, right? They just launched that recently, and we'll have all kinds of beautiful satellite imagery. But this is the unenhanced sort of black and white animation. And you can see this bubbling up of convective activity well to the southwest of Mexico, but nothing organizing uh, as of yet. Probably over the next few weeks we'll have a name storm and eventually a hurricane in this region. That is not at all uncommon, but for now no issues to speak of. Water temperatures in the southeast Pacific um, are quite warm, and this is the equator down here where they're actually cooler as the La Nina pattern that we had still kind of holds on and you get these trade winds blowing across this region keeping the water a little bit cooler. It's just kind of interesting that the water temperatures are cooler along the equator than they are north of the equator. Isn't that weird? But that's just the way it is and most of these water temperatures in here in the low to mid 80s all out across the southeast Pacific and of course the farther north you go the cooler they get right off the coast of California and the Baja water temperatures in the 60s and 70s and that's about as high as they get unless we are in a substantial El Nino which we're not having anytime soon hopefully but uh, bo bottom line is the water temperatures across this region are warm enough once we get into mid-May and that with other factors including the climate record showing that we do have activity a lot of times in May in the Eastern Pacific is why we have the East Pack season starting in mid-May. Although, and I should have put the graphic up where it shows the points of origin, you still have almost as many points of origin over here in mid-May as you do in the Eastern Pacific. So in my opinion, both seasons should just start May 15th, but that's not up to me. Moving right along, when would something potentially develop in the eastern Pacific or for that matter in the Atlantic Basin uh, and that of course is made up of the Western Carib well, the Caribbean Sea as a whole the Gulf of Mexico and the North Atlantic that's what we call the Atlantic Basin and the Madden-Julian Oscillation or the MJO a period of upward motion or fertility I call it in the tropics uh, and we can track this with the various models this is the ECMWF the European model and this is where it is now and the forecast over the next 15 days or so generally heading out of phase one right there weekly as in it's not strong into phase two and it's not very amplified that's a good way to put it uh, and then you have all these different ensemble members that's what the yellow angel hair pasta looking lines are and then this is your envelope sort of outlining the area uh, that borders the different ensemble members and right down the middle is your mean here I guess is if I understand it correctly and overall a favorable MJO pattern for Western Hemisphere development though it's not really strong or abnormally strong things like that it's there 
So a little bit of a favorability period coming up, and the GFS and its ensemble members also showing a similar evolution. And it's rare that these two agree with each other, but that's pretty good agreement overall. And if we look at it graphically here on a map, the GFS over the next several days, this is the current analysis, and then out to day 15. And on here, green typically means favorable, and the brownish colors are unfavorable for upward motion. And so right now, not a lot of favorability going on across the regions that we're talking about. But over the next five to 10 days, you see that it starts to get enhanced, especially out by week two. Now, how reliable is that? Well, larger scale features are going to be more reliable in terms of their depiction in the models rather than your smaller features, such as tropical cyclones. In the bigger picture, these large upward motion events are going to be more easily predicted than a hurricane that develops because of that large upward motion event. Does that make sense? So this might be more reliable that you know, in two weeks that it would happen than saying because that that's there, a hurricane develops somewhere. That's not as reliable because that's trying to pinpoint something in the model field way on out past its ability to be accurate. It's all complicated, but the bottom line, the pattern is shifting and all of the global models, the reliable models for the most part are showing this. This is the climate forecast system version and this goes out to like 40 days, but you can see unfavorable right now and then kind of neutral, neutral, but then in more of an enhancement as we get out into time. And that also, you know, pretty much jives with what the European here shows with its MJO pulse as well. Okay, so all of this adds up to what we're going to get to in a minute. All right, first, this is now down to zero. Let's just go back to the cursor there. Uh, nothing's going to develop from this. A lot of moisture coming up into the southeast, though, from it. You know, from time to time, Florida, the Carolinas, uh, up into the mid-Atlantic states, tons of moisture, very muggy out there. And you'll just have these periods of time where it rains real hard, maybe some thunder and lightning, and it'll go away. But you need it in the southeast and the Florida Peninsula. And as long as it doesn't have 100 mile per hour winds and storm surge associated with it, I guess we can take it, right? All right. Here's a beautiful Go 16 version of what I just showed you. And yeah, we do have this interesting cluster down here. As the upper level pattern gradually changes, it'll enhance the convective process down in the Caribbean. So we're going to see more of this over the coming days, I do suspect. A real quick look at the radar up in the northeast. Boy, yesterday I told you about, and I was showing other people's output. I think it was Ben Knoll uh, down in New Zealand that uh, posted that the other day. I think we talked about it on Monday, I guess, where it looked like that squall line was going to come through here Tuesday, and it did. So lots of damage from that. You saw flash flood emergencies in Frederick, Maryland. And you can see by the radar widespread overall rainy conditions of a scattered nature, if that makes sense. The scattered storms are covering a large area. That's the best way to put it. Offshore of my neck of the woods, I'm over here in Wilmington. Uh, some storms offshore there. The low country of South Carolina doing pretty good. And on down through the peninsula of Florida, for the most part, things are clear with just scattered storms here and there. Nothing concentrated in terms of widespread heavy rain. You're going to just run into these patches here and there, and then that'll be it. And this is going to persist for the next several days, which again, to relieve the drought conditions that we're setting in, this is not such a bad thing. All righty, so what may happen in the Gulf, or not the Gulf, well, maybe the Gulf, but the Western Caribbean. It's not Atlantic hurricane season yet on a calendar, but Mother Nature probably couldn't care less about a calendar. And there's a lot of talk and has been a lot of talk for the last 10 days that in the longer range, GFS output, the deterministic model, and I guess even some of the ensembles from time to time, there has been development sometimes of a strong hurricane. We see this on social media. People talk about it. They share the image output. People get worried. They get concerned, they discuss, they share, they like, whatever, and there's very little context with it. It's just 
hey, look what might happen in 10 days, and people get riled up about it, and they don't understand what they're looking at. So we turn to experts, and while I am an expert in certain areas, I'm not an expert in everything. If I was, you know, I could probably just quit and, you know, write a nice book about being an expert at everything. And how boring would that be? If you're an expert in everything, you can't learn anymore. So we turn to people that uh, do know, and for example, Todd Kimberlane here from uh, Southwest Florida Water Management District, and he's a meteorologist, used to be with the National Hurricane Center, so he knows what he's talking about. And this caught my eye, that possible tropical cyclone development in the global models in 10 days or so, a week to 10 days, appears related to a convectively coupled Kelvin wave. What is that, Mark? Believe me, we don't want to get into that right now. We can talk about that later, but I want to just move on. It's basically an added enhancement in the MJO that comes across and helps to enhance convection. All right, That's one way to look at it. Um, this will be propagating out of the East Central Pacific All right, over the next 7 to 10 days. And then he goes on to say, whatever forms, if anything, is likely to encounter considerable westerly shear, which of course is expected considering that it is late May. And then he's got these different graphics. This is representative. Uh, explaining this to you would be mind-numbing, so we'll just move on. This is some of the depictions of what the models show, simulated infrared. We've seen this shared on social media. But upper-level winds, not very conducive overall. So whatever we get is probably going to be a big rain producer and not much of a wind issue. We'll see. You never know. You never say it's never going to happen because the first time you do that, it will happen. And in geologic time, if it's happened once, it will happen again. You can count on it. So saying something's never going to happen is just as foolish as saying in 10 days there's going to be a hurricane in some location. Uh, that's also, that doesn't work, all right? So let's look at the model output, and I'll show you what the GFS showed today out to the next seven days. This is our disturbance that's a 0% chance of doing anything other than bringing rain. Here's our big old Bermuda high flexing in and out as the days progress. And then here is the Caribbean Sea, and you notice you get this sort of westerly wind anomaly that will show up at 5,000 feet. This does not show anomalies, but I know that it's an anomaly. And you get this sort of gyre that develops right through here, this Central American gyre, where it's a large rotating area of air, basically, okay? And this is coming closer into the time frame now. Let me just stop what we've got, and I'll show you, all right? First, we'll get rid of the telestration. And so this is the first frame right here. Get my pointer back. And here's the last frame, all right? So look, this is now down out at 168 hours. So we're not talking, you know, 240 hours or whatever, 10 days. This is a week away. And what it is showing is a fairly large scale feature, this gyre that kind of wraps up down here. Whether or not it's exactly there is not the point. It is starting to get closer into, I mean, let's just back up. Let's see if it's detectable uh, even at day five. So we'll go, there's day six. Yeah, it's there. So there's day five right there. So in five days, you see this anomaly showing up down here. And again, I know that it's an anomaly. It's this westerly wind anomaly that comes through that convectively coupled Kelvin wave, the upward motion. It's all coming together. So in about five days, energy tries to develop down in the southwest Caribbean and from there we're just gonna have to see what happens as you saw the last frame it starts to try to curl up and you can go and you can say well what what does it look like after 168 hours and if you want to read the end of the book that may not even be written that way go ahead and do that but it's so far out in time why even worry about it my concern is heavy rain for Central America people live there and these tropical systems, whether or not they develop, can dump 10 to 20 inches of rain, especially if they move slowly. So we have to focus on the overall hazard picture, and heavy rain is a hazard, uh, before we get all you know, wrapped up in, will there be a hurricane in my town on Memorial Day, or whatever. All right, so let's just be patient. 
see how things evolve. We do have awesome people that we can follow, like uh, like Todd Kimberlane that I showed you, and others. And I will be pointing that out from time to time, because that's how we learn. We learn from the people and develop a consensus from those who know best. They don't know everything, but if you get everybody together in that collective knowledge, it really does help. All righty. So that's it. I'm done for now. I am Mark Suttoth for HurricaneTrack.com. By the way, later this afternoon, I don't know exactly when, but if you follow me on Facebook at the Hurricane Track page on Facebook, it's Facebook.com slash Hurricane Track. I mean, everything's Hurricane Track, all one word. That's the brand. Later this afternoon, probably in the 4 o'clock hour, I'm going to do a Facebook Live where I'm going to talk about the changes to the National Hurricane Center's products for 2018. I thought it was pretty interesting, especially some of them. Some of them are kind of mundane, internal things, but some of them are really interesting. So if you're following Hurricane Track on Facebook, be sure to put your notifications on. And when I go live, you'll see it. And if you don't watch it live, of course, it'll be archived for later. All right, I'm done for now. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com. Thanks for watching. I'll be back with more tomorrow.